I, <clears throat> I think we should start, everybody. Uh, there'll, be a, <clears throat> there'll be a bunch of people still trickling in who are out, still outside uh, picking up something to eat, I guess. But uh, we, wanna, we do have a hard stop at 10.50, so uh, I think it's important that we, uh, uh, that we get going. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is D I'm Dick Morningstar. I'm the chairman of the Atlanta Council Global Energy Center. Uh, I'm sure most of you have been here before to our, uh, our events. And it's a pleasure for me, a uh, particular pleasure, uh, to welcome uh, Spencer Dale, uh, who is BP's group chief economist, who will be, uh, and today will be the launch of the 2017 BP Statistical Review. Uh, it's, it really has been a, a privilege for, uh, and is a privilege for the Atlanta Council uh, to be hosting, uh, to be hosting this event. We did it last year as well, and uh, uh, and uh, we are looking forward very much uh, <clears throat> to Spencer's presentation. Uh, this statistical review is widely anticipated every year. Uh, it's really looked to as the gold standard uh, report for policymakers and for industry analysts and energy stakeholders from both the public and private sector. Uh, so Spencer will present the major major findings for for the report. And there, I mean, there are so many issues, so many questions that we can talk about, and he'll talk about. What's the state of global energy demand? Is it going to continue at a low rate? What effect does China have on all of this? Uh, I'm sure uh, Spencer will be able to tell us exactly what's going to happen to oil markets. Uh, what's, going to, uh, uh, what's going to happen? Uh, will coal continue to decline in production? What are the effects of this going to be in the short term and long term uh, for, companies, for companies like BP? Uh, so he'll give a uh, he'll give a presentation uh, and has a I think an extraordinary slide deck uh, which makes it I, I think uh, uh, very very easy to understand. Uh, then we'll have uh, uh, I'll ask a couple of questions and we'll open it up to uh, uh, questions from the audience. So uh, I, I should. Before I turn it over to Spencer, just briefly mention uh, that he's been the chief economist at BP since October of 2014, and prior to that was the executive director for financial stability at the Bank of England. Uh, so I guess you managed to avoid Brexit and what those effects are going to be. Uh, and in any event, prior to that, was a member of the Financial uh, Policy Committee there. So uh, again, thank you for being here, and I will turn it over to you for your presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Dick and the Atlantic Council for hosting me uh, again this year, and um, thank you to all of you for sparing the time uh, to to come to the um, to the U.S. launch of the uh, of BP's 2017 Statistical Review of World Energy. Now, hopefully, many of you know BP Statistical Review um, and and, of, and are users of it. Um, I think it's fair to say that it is pretty much the reference source for global energy data for for industry, for governments, uh, for analysts. Um, and I always say, don't take my word for it. If you if you're not familiar and you're not sure. When you go back to your office, Google five uh, energy stories. And if they've got a chart or they've got any sort of data, my hunch would be over 80% of them at the bottom will say uh, source BP statistical review. It's just a free good to help everybody have the same data set, and then we can start disagreeing, but at least we disagree on the about, um, we can disagree on other things other than the um, data. So the launch largely is to say, guys, the new data available. All those Excel spreadsheets are available on bp.com. Go away, download them, and you can start doing your own analysis. I quite like that of the launch, but then my people say, that doesn't make for a very interesting talk, uh, Spence, if you just do that and then sit down again. So what we also do with the Energy Outlook, uh, with the statistical review, is we use the opportunity of bringing those data, those data together to try and then start to tell a story about what happened last year, try to understand what happened last year, and use that to help us better understand how the future may evolve. Now, I, I think 
pretty much every year is interesting in energy markets. I think 2016 was particularly interesting because you had these sort of two separate forces were driving energy markets last year. One was a need for short run adjustments in, in markets. So we well know the need for adjustment in, in the oil market due to the excess supplies we had in the oil market. But you can see that those levels of excess supplies were also evident in the coal market. They're also evident in the natural gas market. So part of what happened last year was the continual adjustment um, of these markets to this short run issue of excess supplies. But at the same time, there was sort of a growing gravitational pull from the longer run energy transition that is taking place at the moment. So on the demand side, a shift in demand away from traditional markets towards um, fast growing developing economies, particularly in Asia, and also slower growth in energy demand as, as countries around the world use energy more efficiently. And on the supply side, this sort of shift towards cleaner, lower carbon fuels, particularly strong growth in renewables. And so when we try and think about what happened last year, a key question to have in our heads is, well, was that just a short run adjustment story and, and therefore is likely to fade out over the next few years? Or is this, is this symptomatic of that longer run energy transition? And so it gives me a signal about the future and trying to, trying to take to understand the relative contributions of the short run adjustment and long run transition, I think is one of the fascinating things um, which happened, um, uh, which, which, is, which is one of the issues for 2016. Let me think about 2016's data. The confluence of those two, let's see if this is going to work. Ah, oh, it's on. The confluence of those two forces can be seen, hopefully everybody can see these things. I'll, I'll talk as we go through. Can be seen in, in the global energy, um, in terms of global energy demand, which grew by only 1% last year. That's the, the purple line. That's around half the growth rate seen, just a little more than a half of the growth rate seen over the last 10 years. So weak growth in global energy demand. Now, some of that story is a short run story. So global GDP was, uh, growth was particularly weak last year. So some of this is a short run transitional story. But there's also a longer run thing going on here. This is the third consecutive year in which we've had growth rates of, of a global energy demand of 1% or low. So we're starting to see this run of weak growth in global energy demand. And the counterpart to that is significantly um, increasingly large gains um, or reductions in energy intensity. So the amount of energy that you need to produce each unit of GDP. And so essentially, we've seen weaker growth in global energy demand because we're using that energy more efficiently. So every time we try to grow, we need less energy to, to grow um, forward. That, that looks better. Thank you. Um, in terms of um, the, the fuel mix, in terms of um, the, where's that growth coming from, as is now the new normal, all, nearly all of that growth or all of that growth came from the developing world. The contribution from the OECD here is in green. And if you're thinking, oh, I'm at the back, I can't see um, uh, the contribution from the OECD. No, you can see it. It's because it essentially was, was zero. All of the growth was coming from the developing world, with China and India, shown here in the, in the two blue bars, contributing pretty much equal amounts and accounting for around half of the growth in global energy demand. So half of the growth in global energy demand coming first from China and India. What's interesting there, if you look at the Indian bars, which are the light blue ones, they're pretty sort of, their contribution is not sh shifting significantly relative to the last 10 year average. But a sharp slowing in, in the Chinese um, growth of Chinese energy demand relative to the last 10 years or so. And, and, that, and that's sort of a key driver of that weakness um, we saw in global energy demand is what's happening in China. And I'll come back to that towards the end and, and, and sort of um, think a little bit more about um, how to think about what's happening in, in China. In terms of the fuel mix, one of those big issues that we were, um, that I was talking about the short run adjustment um, was, was reflected in the fact that the consumption of oil uh, coal and natural gas last year was significantly greater than the production. You can just see that by comparing these consumption numbers with the production numbers. And that's part of that short run adjustment mechanism we were talking about. Excess supplies in all of those markets and consumption growing more quickly as, in, rather than production as those markets were starting to adjust. So that's part of the short run bit. But the long run transition can also be seen clearly here if you think about the contrasting fortunes of renewables and coal. So renewable energy, shown here in this orange bar at the bottom here and the orange bar here, continued to grow strongly, was the fastest growing um, energy source. 
Renew um, when we when BP thinks about renewable energy here, we separate out hydro energy because it's sort of a different vintage and grows less quickly. So renewable energy here is predominantly um, uh, wind, solar, and biofuels. That accounts around four percent of primary energy, so still quite a small amount. But its growth accounted for around a third of the growth in energy consumption um, and energy supplies last year. So although it's only four percent, it accounted for about a third of the increase. In, in energy. In contrast is what's happening in terms of coal, where we saw a second consecutive year of sharp falls in global coal consumption. So both global coal consumption and production fell sharply. Global coal production um, fell by the, great, the most we've ever seen on record, the largest um, ever fall. And, and it's really quite striking is that the, the pace of deterioration in, in coal, only four years ago, the single we've now seen coal fall back really sharply in the past in terms of the view of, um, um, of the data. What I plan to do now is a little bit what's going what's going on a little bit more. I'm going to start first. Um, Respond to those excess supplies that's been dominating the oil market for much uh, since 2014. And we had a significant adjustment um, last year with strong growth in demand and weak growth in supply. So we start on the demand side, which is on the left hand side here. We saw uh, oil demand grow by 1.6 million barrels a day um, last year. That's strong. That's, you know, that's about 50% more than what you would think of as a trend growth rate, typical um, growth rate. As you can see from the colors there, that light blue is showing us that nearly all of that growth in, in energy demand is coming from oil importers. Um, it's um, essentially benefiting from low oil, um, low, low oil prices um, pushing up um, the demand um, for oil. On the supply side, the main adjustment came in non-OPEC supply. So this is on the supply side, on the right-hand side here. And you see that in the dark green is this sharp fall in non-OPEC um, supply. Non-OPEC supply fell by about 0.8 million barrels a day um, in 2016. That's a, the largest decline for almost 25 years. A big driver there was US tight oil, um, which fell in 2016 after growing strongly in 2015. And that swing from 2015 to 2016 was about a million barrels a day swing. And so a big driver of this adjustment was, was US um, um, tight oil. OPEC production, showing the yellow bars, continued to grow, um, essentially that growth stemming from a combination of Iran, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia. But despite that, overall supply growth relatively weak. So st strong demand growth, weak supply growth was, was allay, were enabled that excess supplies that we've seen um, throughout 2014 and 2015 to be gradually absorbed during 2016. So you can see here daily consumption and daily production gradually coming back into balance into the, by the second half of last year. So for much of 2014 and 2015, every day about a million, a million barrels and a half, one and a half million barrels a day, more consumption, uh, more oil was produced than anybody wanted to consume. We've seen that, that, um, that level of um, um, imbalance gradually be absorbed through, through the second half of, of last year. But that's not before um, Oil inventories rose even further from already high um, levels um, during um, 2016. So, so um, when we start um, the year now with, with um, uh, OECD um, inventories around 300 million barrels a day higher than their five-year five average. So the main focus now, as, as everybody in this room will know, in terms of the oil market is thinking about how quickly those stock levels, those inventory levels, come back down to more normal um, levels. When thinking about the oil market over the last couple of years and then the, the next few years, the sort of the fortunes of the oil market have been dominated by two key players, um, US tight oil and, and OPEC. And so when you have a time you stop and trying to pause at the time and you're thinking about the stories in this Cisco review, is that now as we sort of started to complete a cycle of oil prices, it's a, it's a good time to sort of sit back and say, well, what have we learned 
about the behavior of tight oil and OPEC. And let's think about what that means for the future as well. So if we spend a bit of a moment thinking about what we've learned about those two, and we start, um, first of all, um, with, with US tight oil. I think the key message on, on US tight oil is, is the sort of the short cycle nature of US tight oil means um, it has led up to its billing that it has responded to price signals more quickly than, than other types of conventional oil. And so you can see that um, one way of seeing that is looking at the rig count. So this chart shows monthly movements in, in the number of rigs operating in US tight oil. And you can see that within sort of four, five or six months of prices starting to fall in 2014, rigs were already coming off. So this is really quite responsive. This is not normal conventional oil. You measure in terms of years how quickly it responds um, to price signals. These were coming off within four or five months. Um, the response to prices uh, tr uh, hitting a trough in 2016 and starting to rise was all um, these rigs were, were increasing within three or four months. That those, those movements in rigs then fed through into movements in output growth. So we saw output growth coming off in 2015 and 2016 in terms of US tight oil, and then coming back on um, more, more recently. As we've gone through the last couple of years, some commentators have said, I've been surprised by the resilience of US um, tight oil. I think it's really important to be clear what we mean by resilience. U.S. tight oil did live up to its billing. It did respond more quickly than conventional oil in, 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 um, in, uh, in the conventional oil in response to price signals, coming off more quickly as prices um, um, came off, and then rising more recently as prices are picked up. And so in that sense, it has done its job in terms of dampening price volatility. Because you're seeing this response in terms of activity, that acts to dampen price volatility both on the way down and more recently on the way up. I think the resilience, so I think that, so in that sense, I'm not quite sure what, what, what some commentators meant by that resilience, because it has behaved in the way um, that we thought it would do. For me, I think the resilience of Thai oil is better described in terms of a toy I used to have when I was growing up. And that toy was called a weeble. So in the UK, they were called a weeble. I'm not sure if anybody can remember. Do you have weebles in America? You have weebles. Now, if anybody can remember what happens with weebles, weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. Remember? Weebles wobble, but you don't fall down. This is how I think you should think about US Thai oil. Um, the short cycle nature of US tight oil means as prices fall, it does fall back more quickly than other types of oil. But over the longer run, the US um, tight oil is not the marginal barrel. There are many other types of oil that have higher all in costs. And so as the market adjusts and prices respond, tight oil will bounce back, just like a weed bull just like we're seeing now. And I think that's how we should think about the resilience of tight oil. It will fall back, but it will then bounce back again. And, and that's how I think we should think about um, tight oil when we're thinking about its role in the future. It will act to dampen, to dampen volatility, but as that adjustment process goes through, you would expect it to come back on again. Um, that's tight oil. What about the other main player and main character um, in this drama over the last few years? It, it was OPEC. And OPEC had been sort of, um, has, has surprised people on, on at least two occasions over this period of time. First of all, they surprised people in November 2014 when they decided not to cut production and prices collapsed. And then they seemed to change course um, at the end of um, last year, uh, in November uh, 2016, when they decided, together with 10 non-OPEC players, um, to cut production, um, um, and, and which, as you know, they recently um, extended to go through into the, um, the beginning of next year. So how do we make sense of what OPEC was doing? Why did they decide not to cut in the first place and then change their mind and, and cut? Were they behaving inconsistently? Did they have a change of thought? Or how do, how do we think about this? I think the best way of, uh, of thinking about um, the behavior of OPEC um, can be described in terms of a, um, by, um, by um, was described best by um, 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 His Excellency um, Halid Al-Fali, 
who is the Saudi Arabian Minister of Energy, Industry, and Mineral Resources. So essentially, one of the absolute leaders of OPEC. And he made this speech um, at Sierra Week um, earlier this year. And I'll, I'll read out the speech for those who can't see it at the back, and then we'll think about what it means. So OPEC remains an important catalyst to the stability and sustainability of the market. So OPEC remains key. But history has also demonstrated that intervention in response to structural shifts is largely ineffective. That's why Saudi Arabia does not support OPEC intervening to alleviate the impacts of long-term structural imbalances, as opposed to addressing short-term aberrations. I used to be a central banker, so I like really sort of um, coded um, language. But let's unpack that a bit and see what that sort of means to people who, who don't spend their lives um, thinking about central banking type statements. Um, the power of OPEC stems from its ability, it's a cartel. So what's the power does it have? Its power stems from its ability to shift supply from one period to another. That's what it can do. It can produce, increase or decrease supply for a period, and then it can bring it back on. So it has lots of power in response to temporary shocks, what um, the minister here is calling short-term aberrations. If something happens to demand, that demand is weak for a period of time, or supply is strong for a short period of time, it can adjust its supply, it can reduce supply for a period of time to offset that impact, and then as that shock subsides, it can bring it back on again. And by doing that, it can smooth through that shock. But suppose in response to a permanent shock, if you have a permanent shock, shifting supply from one period to another has no impact if the shock carry on, carries on persisting. So it has, strong, has a strong power in terms of temporary shocks, but not in terms of structural ones. Now what does that, so what Spencer, how does that relate to what, anything we're talking about here? Think about 2014. The emergence of supply imbalance in 2014 was, was to do with the growth of US tight oil. US tight oil wasn't a temporary shock, it was a structural shock. Remember the Weeble. It doesn't go away. This is a structural thing which is not going to go away. And so the ability for OPEC to respond to that was relatively limited, um, um, just as the minister said. What, what about now? How do we think about the decision in, in November 2016? The, the focus here in terms of OPEC's decision is trying to increase the pace at which stocks, oil inventories, come back to more normal levels. This is exactly the type of short-term aberration in which OPEC intervention can be um, effective. So I withdraw supply in the market for a period of time to leave space for stocks to be withdrawn down. As stocks get drawn down to more normal levels, I can then bring back my supply back onto the market and I can then smooth through that impact and, and quicken up the pace. So my view would be, um, um, I think in some sense there wasn't any inconsistency in the behavior of OPEC. They behaved in an entirely consistent way, but when we think about how they respond, you need to think about the nature of the shock, the nature of the disturbance they're responding, um, trying to, to respond to. In 2014, it was a structural shock, and, and the ability to respond to structural shocks by just shifting supply from one period to another is very limited. More recently, um, we're, we're seeing them respond to a temporary shock where they can have far more um, impact. That's what I want to say on the oil market. If we turn next to coal, as, as I was saying, I think we are seeing a significant and decisive shift in, in, in coal and break from, from, the, from, from the past in terms of coal. Many of those factors driving that, the key at the heart of that, um, of that shift are structural long-term factors. The growing competitiveness of natural gas and renewable energy combined with sort of mounting government and societal pressure to move to towards cleaner, low uh, lower carbon fuels. But those, co those structural pressures often then lead to short-term policy responses, which provide even greater amount of sort of compound some of those uh, forces. And we saw that last year, in, in particular in China, so what happened in China last year, the beginning of 2016, they announced a series of measures essentially designed to reduce the degree of spare capacity within their domestic coal system and also to improve the productivity and profitability of the remaining mines. And as part of that, they, they restricted production levels so, so, that, so that mines could only produce for 276 days rather than 330 
um, days. And for those of you who are interested in this stuff and haven't looked at this Chinese policy, it's magnificent. It's really fascinating just to think about um, um, how it was designed. The impact of these measures was really stark. Coal production in, in, um, in, in China fell dramatically, by far the biggest fall we've ever seen in coal production in China. And, and, and coal prices in China increased very sharply as production was, was pulled off, um, increasing by over 60% during the course um, of 2016. As a result of which, we also saw uh, Chinese coal consumption fall for the third consecutive year. The nature of the global coal markets meant global prices then took their cue um, from what was happening in, in China with coal prices around the world all following a similar trend. And that then, had, that then feed, fed through onto squeezing coal um, demand around the world where we saw the second um, consecutive fall in global coal consumption. And I said um, the largest ever fall in terms of our records in terms of global coal um, production. So these structural, these structural long-term transitional uh, impacts overlaid and compounded by some of these short-run things um, going on. That's, that's, that gain, that thing I, I was saying at the beginning of short-run transitions, uh, short-run adjustments and long-run um, transition. A particularly extreme example of some of, of, what, of this sort of shift away from coal can be seen um, in the UK. It's, it's, it's unusual for the UK to be interesting in terms of energy markets, but this is one time where the UK is interesting, where it's almost gone an incomplete um, cycle for coal. For those at the back who can't see this chart, they can just see it go up and down. The key thing to, to know here, the, the, the scale starts in 1800. Okay, so what happens is we've seen an almost complete cycle of, of, of coal within the, UK, um, within the UK, with the last three underground coal mines closing last year, the levels of consumption of coal um, in 2016 back to, to where they were almost 200 years ago at the time of the Industrial Revolution. And April of, and in April of this year, the UK power sector um, having its first ever coal-free day. So it's sort of an end of an era uh, for coal in the UK. And it's, if you had time, it's a really fascinating era. So that era started with um, the first steam locomotive and the first ever coal-fired power station. Then it goes through this period of time when we had the Clean, uh, the clean Air Act, as people worried about smog uh, in London. We had the miners' strike, which is at the heart of, um, of Margaret Thatcher's um, original um, rise um, to power. And then more recently, um, towards the end, the dash for gas um, within, the, within the UK and also also the growing rise of renewables. So really um, fascinating um, history, sort of playing out in real time in terms of um, coal. If we move to next to, to natural gas, in terms of natural gas, it's a relatively muted year for natural, um, for, for, for natural gas. Um, demand grew by about 1.5% in, in 2016, which is um, slower than its long run average. And on the, on the, on, on the on production on the right hand side, um, coal, um, gas production was essentially um, flat. Um, its weakest growth outside of the, the uh, financial crisis for almost 25 um, years. Much of that weakness, particularly on the production side, um, was dominated by, by the US where the combination of low gas prices causing, caused um, uh, rigs in, in dry gas plays to fall, combined with the weakness of oil price prices pushing down on associated gas, meant U.S. gas production fell um, for the first time since the U.S. Um, shale gas revolution um, uh, um, started. So a lot, of, a lot going on in terms of the U.S. explaining some of the weakness on the production side. The bright spot um, for, um, for natural gas was... was um, uh, liquefied natural gas, LNG. So on the supply side, I think 2016 is, if you think of it, is a sort of the first real year of the growth spurt we expect to see um, in liquefied natural gas over the next three or four years, with nearly all of this growth coming from Australia. So we saw a whole number of, of, of LNG, Australian LNG projects come on stream um, last year. A little bit of this other was in the US, where we saw the first two uh, trains um, come out from, from, the, from the US, but the vast majority coming from um, Australia. On the demand side shown on the right here, 
Australia remains the dominant market. Uh, 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 China remains the dominant market for, for um, natural gas. But what you also saw, which is sort of quite an interesting feature, is a number of new entrants, um, a, a new, new sources of market demand um, uh, emerge over the last few years, shown in these red bars here. So countries like Egypt, Pakistan, Poland, all started to consume um, natural gas um, for the first time. So if you like, as an economist, this is a great example of what economists would say is Say's law. So new supply creating its own demand, which is sort of a fascinating thing when you think about how the, how the LNG market may then evolve um, as we go forward. So as, as LNG continues to grow, which we expect really rapid growth of LNG over the next few years, I think that's likely to have some tremendous impacts in terms of the way the global gas market um, behaves. Um, we're likely to see um, increasing integration of, of the global um, of, of the gas market. So rather than segmented markets broken down in terms of North American market, um, European and Asian market, the emergence of a global gas market, and also the emergence of a more flexible, competitive um, market with, with, more, with, more act, with far more competition. And we can start to see that already in terms of some of the features of what's going on. So if you look at um, the, um, the LNG markets, we're seeing a number of moves towards shorter contracts, um, smaller contracts, and more generally, an increasing amount of LNG trade, which is not contracted and is freely traded um, um, and, and is freely traded. So it's quite a significant shift in terms of this movement towards a more flexible, competitive market structures. And I think that's only likely to increase over the next few years. When thinking about LNG and, and global gas markets, a particularly fascinating market is Europe. And it's fascinating um, because on the one hand, Europe's large and increasing need for, you, for, for imported gas, together with its position sort of in a relatively central position amongst a number of LNG exporters, means many people think of, of Europe as a natural growth market for gas. But on the other hand, Europe's access to low-cost pipeline gas, particularly from Russia, means that LNG is likely um, to face stiff competition. So you have this sort of comp this, this battle of competing supplies in Europe. And in terms of that battle of competing supplies, in 2016, the battle went to pipeline gas. So what you saw in 2016 is Europeans' imports of gas, shown here in this sort of significant inc increase significantly in 2016. So Europe's need for imported gas rose really quite significantly in 2016. But all of that gas, the, the increase in gas demand, was met by pipeline gas, by a combination of Russian gas and Algerian gas, shown those two bars there. Um, the growth of, of, of LNG, almost no growth um, in liquefied natural gas. So by pipeline gas um, rose. The economic incentives here, as we play out this game, are clear. So just as with OPEC response um, to tight oil, Russia has a clear economic incentive to try to maintain its market share in response to the growing structural um, competition from LNG. It's not going away, so the natural thing for it to do would be to try and maintain its market share just as OPEC did. This competitive process, though, is, is then complicated by the issues associated with Europe being overly dependent on a single source of supply and the sort of energy security issues and that may raise. The interesting question here, though, is whether the growth of LNG may mitigate some of those energy concerns by developing a globally integrated market where you have the option of being able to consume LNG if you need it. And so the key point here, the key sort of argument I'm making here, is you don't necessarily, Europe doesn't necessarily need to consume lots of LNG in normal times if it has the option of being able to consume LNG if and when the need arises. So if it has enough regasification facilities, it doesn't necessarily need to consume lots of LNG as long as it knows if it has the option of doing so um, as and when um, um, the need arises. And so it may well be that the LNG actually acts to reduce some of these energy um, issues. But this, but this all comes down to this battle of competing supplies, which um, I think will play out over the next uh, few years. In terms of um, 
renewables, which are obviously sort of at the, in, in the leading edge of the energy transition, they continue to grow strongly uh, last year, led by um, wind um, and, and, and solar uh, power. Oh, um, the key driver here was really strong growth um, in, in Chinese uh, renewable power. It counted for um, over 40% of the growth in renewable power, more than the entire OECD put together, and, and overtook the US as the largest producer of renewable power. One thing I found interesting in this year's data um, was what happened in, in, in um, the EU, in this brown bar here, where growth of renewable power in the EU almost didn't grow at all, which is sort of quite striking because you think, well, EU is in the vanguard of pushing renewable power. And the story here reflects the fact that, that load factors on wind and solar power in 2016 fell quite sharply relative to 2015. And as a result of which, even though new capacity was brought on, because those utilization rates were lower, you got almost no growth. And so what I think this just reminds us, is a good way of reminding us, is the, the variability the, um, the, the, um, the weather conditions and can introduce to, to, to renewable energy the, 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 uh, growth, even from a, not just a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week position, but from a year-to-year -year position. And that's what drove this weakness um, in renewable power um, in, um, uh, in 2016 in the EU. Wind continue to be the dominant source of growth, but solar is catching up quick. And this chart here just looks at the, the pace of diffusion of, of wind and, and solar power across a, a, a very large number of countries over the last 20 years or so. And you can see that, that wind has, dif um, the pace of diffusion of solar power has been significantly quicker than that for wind. And that's helped, I think, both by the more modular nature of wind and also its steeper um, learning curve. Okay, so that's sort of bringing all the fuels um, together. Uh, given the time, I'm going to pull the, bring all this together, and I want to focus just on one issue. How did all these things come together in terms of carbon emissions? I'm just going to miss out the power sector and think about how did all this come together in terms of um, carbon emissions? So the key thing here is the combination of slower um, energy growth combined with this shift in fuel mix four sharp falls in coal, strong growth in renewable energy, meant that carbon emissions um, slowed, um, um, were relatively low last year. In fact, um, we estimate that carbon emissions are essentially flat. Carbon emissions from energy use was essentially flat last year. This is the third consecutive year in which carbon emissions have been flat. If you look at, if you look at this, this, this breakdown, some of, of this weakness reflects slowing growth in GDP, but the main driver here reflects falls in the carbon intensity of GDP. So for every unit of GDP which is produced, we're emitting less carbon. That's shown those green bars. If I decompose, decompose those, those green bars into their, their two components, that reflects two things. A, it falls in energy intensity, which it was using before. So as we produce a, a, new, a new unit of GDP, we need less energy to do that. Moreover, the energy we're using um, is also becoming cleaner and lower, lower carbon, shift away from coal, increasing natural gas, increasing new, renewable energy. And those two things together are leading to this, um, this slowing in carbon emissions. Now, this slowing in carbon emissions is, 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 is significant and profound. So this is the third year in which we've seen essentially no growth in, in, in carbon emissions. <coughs> This compares to the previous 10 years in which carbon emissions were growing at somewhere like 2.5% a year. So the critical, critical question here, the absolutely, perhaps the single most important question raised by this year's statistical review is, um, is this, is this long-run transition, is this structural, is this a decisive break from the past? In which case, this would represent a significant step in terms of where we need to, to get to, to Paris. Or is this largely uh, temporary? Is it largely cyclical and therefore may well unwind over the next few years? So how do we think about this? So in terms of just, just, just sort of disaggregating this to try and understand what's going on, this chart, the way to read this chart is, this looks at growth, average growth of carbon emissions, this black bar here, over the 10 years, um, um, sort of between 2003 and 2013, where it was growing about 2.5% a year. And then contrast that with the last three years, where it's essentially been flat and said, what's the driver here? What's, what's accounted for this big change? 
And what it screams at you is, it's China. So if you want to understand if this is structural or if this is te uh, uh, temporary, you need to understand what's going on um, in China. China's carbon emissions have fallen in outright terms over the last two years. In the previous 10, they rose by 75%. That's an enormous switch. Now, some of what's going on um, in China, I think, is, is a structural, uh, well, st are structural changes as it moves to a more sustainable pa uh, pattern, of, uh, pattern of growth. So three things here, slower economic growth, a shift in the, ec in the structure of that economic growth away from the industrial sector, industrialization, which is very energy intense, towards um, um, consumer and service-facing growth, which is far less energy intensive, and also a shift in the fuel mix away from coal towards more or less everything else. So rapid growth in nuclear power, rapid growth in renewable energy, rapid growth um, in, in natural gas. Those trends are structural trends and are likely to persist. But also, some of this weakness reflects the, some, some very sharp um, falls in some of the key sectors within China um, over the last few years. In particular, if we look at iron, steel, and cement, for much of the, of the 2000s, iron, steel, and cement were growing at over 10% a year, output of those three sectors. And, and essentially, they were growing at over 10% a year because that was what was fueling China's rapid industrialization. You saw the industrialization of China that, that led to huge growth in iron, steel, and cement. Though output in those three sectors have fallen in outright terms, in absolute terms, over the last three years. Why does this matter? Because these three sectors on their own account for around a quarter of China's energy. So if I then say, well, um, what's caused the slowdown in China's energy demand? You can see a big factor which is causing this slowdown in China's energy demand is these three sectors, rather than adding to China's energy demand, have contracted very significantly from China's energy demand over the last three years. It seems to me um, very likely that, um, as, as, that, that some of this uh, slowdown will not be sustained, will won't be repeated, and we're likely to see some, um, um, some unwinding of some of this weakness uh, as, we, as we go forward. And, that's to, and that, as you see that, then some of this weakness we see in both energy demand and, um, and, and, and in carbon emissions may well unwind. So when we think about this, this good news story in terms of carbon emissions, is it, is it structural, is it um, temporary? I think the answer is it's a bit of both. But exactly how much, what the proportions of those two are, I think it's hard to tell. But it, thinking hard about these sectors and how China's economy is likely to evolve going forward, I think is our key um, to that. OK, let me um, wrap up. And so we've got plenty of time uh, uh, for, for questions um, uh, uh, on, on, the, on whole, these range of issues. As I said, I think 2016 is fascinating. So, a, it's fascinating just because all sorts of interesting things happen. But it's fascinating in particular because you have saw this confluence of these short-run factors and, and these and long-run transition come together. And it's trying to understand the, the roles of those two things. The big story was this weak growth in energy demand and, and, and the corresponding very weak growth in carbon emissions. I think you can trace that to China. And then when you look even deeper into China, I think some of that's structural and some of that is, um, is a short-run adjustment. Some of the growth we saw in some markets, I think, were dominated by short-run factors. I think a particular example here is the oil market with that strong growth in oil demand. I don't think that's telling us that we expect oil demand to grow 50% quicker um, for the next future. I think that's telling us about how it's responding to low prices as the market adjusts. But then some of those other factors, some of the other fuels, more consistent with this longer-run transition. And in that sense, I think the contrasting trends of this strong growth in uh, renewables and uh, compared with this sort of declines in, in coal are, are, are sort of more indicative of some of this longer-run um, transitional issues. OK, um, let me stop there. But as I said, the key thing um, for today um, is just to tell everybody the new data are available. Um, this is a story we told. And there's an awful lot more stories you can tell. And um, over to you, and you can tell your, your own stories for that. Thank you very much. I'll take my weeble with me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Spencer. That was just an incredible report and uh, so clear. I mean, it was just terrific. Uh, I'm going to ask just one question and then turn it to the audience. We have a half hour.
uh, and it's a little bit of a triple question in one, and, and, uh, but I'll try it anyway. Uh, and that is, this is just a great look at what the situation is today. If we were all to come back here, some of us may still be around 20 years from now, uh, in 2037, and uh, you and you're here and you're looking back over the last 20 years from you know what you've said today, what do you think are the three or four key st long-term structural changes that will in fact happen? Uh, what do you see as black swans that could either accelerate or decelerate movement towards a, a, a low carbon economy? And finally, does Trump's, President Trump's decision uh, on climate change or on Paris and some of the other actions taken, does that have any relevant effect, do you think, on that deceleration or is it just at most a bump in the road? That's why Dick used to be an ambassador. They can ask such a complicated three, uh, three questions all in one go. Um, I think what we're pretty confident about, I think we're pretty confident we'll see rapid growth in renewable energy, wind and solar. Those technology gains are going to continue. The, um, societal pressure to move towards that will continue. There's a question mark of just how rapidly they'll grow, but they'll carry on um, growing. I think another thing we'll be pretty confident about is technology will keep improving, and that technology will have two things. One is it will mean we'll be, we'll, we'll be getting even better at producing energy, and, we'll be, and the second one is we'll be even better at increasing the efficiency with which we produce, use energy, and those two things together will mean we'll have a growing abundance of energy. And I think a key feature over the next 20 years is we think of last, much of the last 20 years have been worried about scarcity, where we run out of oil, where we run out of things. We're not going to run out of these things. We're moving to a world of abundance. And I think that abundance and the issues associated with abundance will become bigger and more important over that time. And I think the third will be um, this sort of increasing dominance of the developing world in terms of our markets for energy. And perhaps the fourth one, actually, is, which I think is really important, is the growing electrification of, um, of the world. So... Uh, Plausible estimates suggest that around two-thirds of, of the growth of primary energy over the, next two, uh, over the next 20 years will be absorbed by the power sector. So if you have any interest in, as, as a producer of where your market is, or as a policymaker in terms of affecting uh, uh, the, the fuel mix, it's the power sector which is going to be critical. So the increasing importance of power and electricity, I think, will be key. So they're my, my three, renewables, um, technology, um, power. What are the, um, your black swans or what could be the key drivers here? I think one absolute key driver is an obvious one, but it's, it's absolutely critical, is um, government policies. And the key thing here will be um, on, on climate policies, just um, how... How, to, to what extent will, will governments take their commitment to, to get to Paris um, uh, seriously and will start um, in, in moving up, um, particularly in terms of carbon pricing, putting a cost price on carbon and committing there? I think that will have a big impact on terms of the fuel mix um, issue. I think the other thing, perhaps even more powerful than government policies, will be societal pressures. What, what will, how will society respond? Will, um, in London a few years ago, um, it started to become, in London, sort of socially unacceptable to drive an SUV. Uh, because somehow, A, because London's so small, you'd the idea of a big 4x4 driving through the streets, London wasn't going to make sense. But also because this is, they're not very efficient in terms of energy. And if we start seeing people, my, my children still behave as if um, electricity grows in walls. Um, but if over a period of time that if we walk into a room and the lights are still on, or if we walk into a room, it, it, often in, 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 in the US, and the air conditioning is turned right, right, right up, and we say, hold on, that's, that's a waste of energy. We should stop doing that. That could be fundamentally different. So I think societal pressures and how society responds to energy, I think, is a key driver, because that, that can move things far more quickly than technology or, or um, policy. Your final part, I think, of your question was, how does um, the current administration's decide, uh, decision to withdraw from Paris change this issue? 
When we look over the next 20 years, we expect carbon emissions to, um, to slow quite significantly. The key driver of that is, is developments in, 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 the, in, the, in the developing world. So the key driver of that wasn't what's happening in the OECD or in America. The key drivers of those, of those developments was the developing world, much of it helped by technology. So I think the significance of of the administration's decision to withdraw is less to do with the numbers, because much of those numbers were much of that improvement was happening outside the U.S. It seems to me the key issue here is that the U.S. has played a, a very significant leadership role um, over the last few years in terms of bringing everybody to the table in Paris and galvanizing that the, the momentum to get everybody to the table and, and, and signed up to Paris. If, and, and, I, and it is an if, but if um, the, the current administration's decision to, to withdraw from Paris means it, it withdraws from that leadership role, the question then will become, does that mean we lose momentum or can, we, can, can that momentum continue? And I think, I don't know the answer to that, but I think that's the significance, less to do with numbers and more to do with, does this reduce the global momentum to do something about climate change? Good, thank you. Well, let's open it up. Uh, I see a couple of hands. Please uh, uh, identify yourself when you ask, make your comment or ask the question. Yes, over there. Hi, Zip Train AU. Uh, oh. Zip Train AU. Um, your chart says that China play a major role in the reduction of, you know, uh, consumption of fossil fuel. Yet, China's strategy for one bet, one road is energy gouging. And it would be the f number one carbon emission country. Can you explain that? Yes, yeah, so how do I explain? So the key thing here is China is still, uh, China's energy is still growing. Uh, China is still the largest growth market for energy. Um, and so in that sense, um, the, the issue is still growing and it will carry on growing. The point here is not, it, it's the fact that it's growing so much less rapidly than the past. So in some senses, um, the issue here is not in outright falls that China's going to be doing huge amounts. It's relative to the past where it was growing very rapidly. That change from growing very, very rapidly to growing relatively slowly in terms of its energy demand and that shift in the fuel mix. So if we look over at the moment today, around two thirds, just less than two thirds of China's energy comes from coal. It's an enormous c consumer of coal. Um, its plans, which I think are extraordinarily ambitious, um, is to get that, that share down to a little below 50%, perhaps by 45% over the next 20 years. So it will still be an enormous consumer of coal. But relative to the past, that change in behavior will be a big thing. So I think what, what my point was doing is the last few years have been very different from the past. So what's caused that change? And I think it's absolutely the key thing here is it's the change in China, which is the key contributor of that, of that change in, in some of these global trends. Even though China will continue um, to, to grow and its energy demand will continue to grow. And I agree with you. I think the One Belt, One Road policy, which I always surprise when I'm in London or in many parts of, of the West, I don't think people are giving enough importance to the one belt, one road policy. It seems to me when I go to China, it is absolutely central um, to much of their international policy. And a key part of that is an energy security issue, making sure that they make, can have the, 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 the security of energy supplies um, coming to China in the future. So, so I, I think it's con what I'm saying is consistent with the one belt, one road policy, but I agree with you. I think the one belt, one road policy is really important when understanding sort of China's international relations and, and its international um, policy. It's interesting on the one belt, one road policy that I think what people are not <clears throat> looking at is how far China is looking to extend its influence moving west and, has, and is working very hard to develop uh, 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 projects uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, as an example. And, 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 and that's exactly what they should do, right. isn't it? I mean, that's exactly what you would do if you was in their situation. They're a major superpower, global superpower. Um, their economy is growing, and it makes natural sense for them to develop trading relationships around the world. Um, in that sense, no difference to the way the UK behaved for many years or no difference to the way the US has behaved for many years. Right, and, and one of the concerns that, that many have talked about with respect to this administration's policy on climate is it's just going to cede soft power leadership as well as economic leadership in this area to, could cede it to the Chinese, which uh, could have a major geopolitical impact as well.
other questions. Oh, now we oh, well, hands are up. Uh, I'll just move back here with a couple and then over there. Uh, Michael Ratner. Hi, Michael Ratner with Congressional Research Service. Um, I was hoping you could elaborate or uh, comment on your, your thoughts regarding Chinese emissions data. China, historically, for oil and gas production, I mean, the numbers have always been held with, you know, uh, taken with a certain grain of salt or skepticism. How real do you think the numbers are, and what do you do to verify uh, those numbers when it comes to emissions? Um, so, on emissions, the estimates of emissions are based on our estimates, not based on, on Chinese estimates, because essentially we look at their fuel mix. Uh, we, we, we have estimates about the carbon emissions associated with fuel mix, and we calculate our own numbers. So in that sense, the actual emissions bit uh, is our own. The caveat to that is the, the underlying energy data are official data. Um, I think it's key, a key sort of position of BP when we produce a statistical review is that statistical review data are based on official estimates for, from, from, from all around the world. They are not our own estimates. We make sure the estimates make sense. We make sure the estimates um, um, are comparable. So if I tell you that's a, that, so that coal and that coal can be compared, so you compare apples and apples and not oranges and oranges. But the, the, the sort of trying to verify, verify the accuracy of any individual country's data and saying, actually, I'm going to second guess it and I'm going to add, add on, it, it would be beyond the task. And it's not what the, the stats review is about. The stats review is not saying, here's our best guess of what happened. It's saying, let me bring all the, the official data together in a way which is comparable, in a way that which is timely, um, um, so people can have it a single source. But, all statistics, um, national statistics, are, are subject to, to, to sampling error, will be revised over time. Um, and so I, I, I'm not sure I can sort of have a strong view that, that my uncertainty with China's data is more uncertain with others. It's a very large economy. It's a very rapid growing economy. We sort of know from sort of economic statistics generally, that's quite a hard thing to measure. What I do find encouraging is the Chinese data are revised regularly. Now, that may sound perverse because you think, well, that, shouldn't that cause you to worry? As an economist, I think, no. What really causes me to worry is when data aren't revised, because we know our knowledge of data will improve over and over time. And if data don't get revised, then I, then I would be concerned, because I think, well, somebody's just writing down a number and not taking this seriously. The fact that their data do get revised regularly, and I think that's a sign, that's a good sign, um, that, that, that as, as new, data, new information comes in, they're, they're willing to revolve, move and, and, and change those data. It's also interesting is they have five-year plans for many things. Often their data aren't consistent with them hitting all of those targets and all those plans. So it's not, um, so I think, you know, there, there are some things there which I think give you some signs for encouragement. Let's take a couple of questions on this side and then I'll go back there and then you can respond to the, to the questions. Okay, yes. So, okay, yes. I see a hand right up front here. The, you, you, you. So Dora Zombri, Embassy of Hungary, and I have a question related to the Qatar. latest developments with Qatar. Uh, how do you see the long-term and the short-term consequences and its impact on the LNG markets? Thank you. Okay. Moving back on this side, another, let's get another uh, question two. or two from this side here. Nobody on this side? You had a lot of hands up before. Okay. Hi, it's just a technical question. Put on the reasoning hand, behind leaving hydropower from renewables, I'm um, Tiago from the Brazilian Embassy. So the reason for? Not considering hydropower oh, okay. as yeah, renewable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you are who? Sorry. Tiago from the Brazilian Embassy. OK. Good. OK. Another question on this side? OK, why don't you answer these two, and then we'll go yeah. back to the other side. Uh, so just on that one, um, technically, in here, what we call renewables, what I call renewables, are actually called other renewables, um, because hydro is obviously a renewable. Um, so this is not in, in any, but I was sloppy in my language. And, and also charts which are called other renewables just look really rubbish. So we just call them renewables. But the point here is just in terms of the, their maturity and their vintage, hydro is in a different space than, than renewables, uh, than other renewables. Aha, I've done it again. And so, um, uh, they're clearly all renewables, but if I'm trying to think about this very rapidly growing thing, that's a different, that's a different beast 
to the maturity of, of hydropower. And so they are, in here, the, the language is a lot better than my sloppy language. Um, there is a class of renewables of which one is hydro, and there's a class of other renewables of which wind, solar, and biofuels are the most important ones. So um, it's it was largely my sloppy language. But the underlying economics here is because if I'm trying to think of something which is growing very rapidly, I don't want that to be weighted down by something which has already sort of reached a far greater degree of maturity. The, the second question on, on the Qatar question. So um, this is obviously uh, early days and, and there's significant uncertainty associated with, um, with what's happening in Qatar in relationship to the, some of the GCC countries. Um, at the moment, it appears this is not having a significant impact on the trade of either natural gas or oil. There are some complicating factors. So we are seeing that some of the Qatar vessels are having to um, refuel in different ports. They're having to take slightly different routes. So this could add some costs. It could add some delays. And so, but, but it doesn't seem like it's having a significant impact at the moment. And my best guess, um, with the huge caveats and health warnings a guess um, brings, is that's likely to be how it um, carries on. The, the sort of um, the caveat here, or the sort of the more worrying is, is you just think about the importance of uh, Qatar. It produces something like 1.8 million barrels a day of oil. It provides around 30% of LNG trade. And so if you saw any significant impacts on their ability to trade energy, the size of Qatar in both oil and, um, and, and, and energy, natural gas, could be very significant at global energy markets. That's not where we are at the moment. That's not my best guess of where it's likely to evolve. But we should be aware this is a major energy producer, and we should be aware of that when thinking about the potential implications this may have. Okay, a couple of questions from this side. The yes. left-hand side of the room is doing far better than the right-hand yeah, side right, here, guys. You're, you're doing a bad they, job. They on had the their right hands side. up yeah, originally, yeah, but then good. they yeah, stopped. They're, they're very okay. cool, yes. We'll, have, uh, the, we'll see if they respond. We'll get, right. yeah. uh, thank you, uh, and uh, congratulations for a fascinating uh, presentation. Jean-François Boitin with IFRI in Paris. And uh, two questions. Uh, on OPEC and U.S. tight oil, how much is the resilience of U.S. tight oil, a structural shock as well as the increase in production in 2014. And the second question on um, LNG and Europe. Uh, your presentation is strikingly different from the one we had uh, three days earlier uh, with the uh, CEO of Tellurian. Uh How much do you believe Russia can actually hamper the development of LNG production in this country? Okay, and then, uh, and what, what was your name again? I don't think you... Sorry, Jean-François Boitin with IFRI in Paris. Good. Okay, let's go to the back. Uh, I see if all the way in the back, and then we'll come back to the middle. Thank you. Uh, my question is about oil prices. And you are who? I'm a car American, Armenian embassy. Seems like half here are from embassies. So uh, my question is about oil prices. Do you have a forecast for uh, upcoming years in your uh, strategic review of how the oil prices will be and what kind of decision will OPEC made in, make in November 2018? Okay, and one more before we that, I turn it back. That's, that's all, just oil prices and OPEC decisions? Okay, fine. I thought you were, I thought you were going to ask a difficult question. Um, okay, the gentleman with the blue shirt right there. And you're, please identify yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Philip Brown. I'm with the Congressional Research Service. Um, for the last couple of years, the International Energy Agency has been somewhat warning that uh, the decline in upstream investment could potentially manifest itself in the next three to five years in significant upward pressure in oil prices, um, sort of indicating that the responsiveness of U.S. tight oil may not be enough to uh, fulfill the supply gap. I realize that's not a consensus view, but I'm interested in your perspective on that. And then a quick question about the data and statistics. Um, has BP ever considered um, teasing out the natural gas liquids uh, from the oil data since arguably they have somewhat different markets and somewhat unique price behaviors. Um, 
uh, it could be argued that separating that might be be useful as NGLs continue to grow. Thank you. Okay, Iran okay. Spencer. Um, is the resilience of tight oil part of the structural story? Yes, absolutely is central to it. So the point about the weeble is you can't kid it off, okay? It bounces back. This is why, I know it's funny, but it's also important, right? So you can't, see so any idea that you're sort of gonna kill off tight oil makes no sense. It's intramarginal. It may fall down for a bit because it can respond more quickly than others. It will bounce back. And, and that is why um, the OPEC decision to not respond in 2014, I think, make economic sense because, um, because of the weeble, because it bounces um, back again. Um, I think, so you, the second question was, can Russia compete effectively with, against US LNG in, in Europe? And I think there's a sort of an economic part of this question and there's a political part of this question. I think the economics are, yes. Okay, so it has very large amounts of low cost oil. It has very large pipelines going into Europe. That gives it an enormous competitive advantage relative uh, to US um, LNG exports. And so in a pure competition sense, yes. The question then is, is how does that then play into this sort of energy security political issues about, well, would that, would that ability to compete, to maintain its market share and even increase its market share be constrained by uh, political events? And my argument is conceivably the ability of the growth of LNG um, may make that less of an issue. And make, make this, so let me think of one way of putting this. At the moment, Europe imports a greater proportion of its oil from Russia than it does gas. Nobody in Brussels, I'm in Brussels next week, nobody in Brussels say, I have a major energy security issue in terms of my imports of oil. Why? Because it knows that if anything happened to its oil imports from Russia, there's a global market for oil and it can go and buy it elsewhere. That's exactly what LNG does for the gas market. You don't have to buy, it doesn't have to buy oil from 20 different countries at the moment because it knows if anything were to happen, it can go to the global market and buy it. The same is true for LNG. It doesn't need to buy lots of LNG. It can buy it from, it has a good fortune that it has a neighbor with lots of low cost gas and a big pipeline going in so it can benefit from low cost gas with the knowledge that if anything were to happen to that, it can go to the market and, and the global market and consume it. And so my argument is that many people initially thought, well, LNG is a bad news story for Russia. I think it's quite conceivable that you may actually end up being a good news story uh, for Russia. There's also a purely political consideration that at least some companies or countries in those companies in those countries will, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, may pay some small premium to have an alternative to have two sources of supply. Yeah, and the key thing is, is in nature of any bargain. If you have an alternative source of supply, you'll tend to get a better bargain. So part of the thing here is, as long as you have the ability to access LNG, then the sort of um, negotiations, your ability to get a good deal in terms of your Russian world will, will improve that, that much um, more. Um, do I, I have a forecast for uh, oil prices over the next year or so? Um, um, no, sorry. Um, 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 and if I did, uh, there will be lost in terms of the caveats and uncertainties. I think if you want, the key issue over the next year or so will be sort of just how successful, I mean, sorry, this is sort of obstating the obvious, is how successful, well, two, two key drivers. One is the compliance of OPEC, and will that deal stick? And secondly, just how rapidly the US tight oil will grow. I think those, those two things together are essentially all you need to know. If we knew the answer to those two things, we'd be a lot closer um, to knowing the answer um, to, to what happened to oil prices. Um, how will OPEC respond in March of 2018? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I think it will be a function of what happens to stock levels relative to normal levels. And, and many OPEC statements have defined normal levels in terms of their five-year average. So that's what they have stated as a, a, a sort of metric for normality. And so I think it's, more, at the moment, they remain very high relative to um, five-year uh, average. And you would need to see a very big 
draw in the second half of the year to actually get to complete that junk, that, that um, adjustment by sort of March of next year. Um, but I think that will be the key um, decider of, of that. Um, a gentleman asked about this IEA, which is often referred to as supply gap, which doesn't make sense in the market, but it's sort of, uh, it's sort of that supply tightness causing prices to spike. And the, the, issue, the issue here is, if you look at levels of investment spending in 2015, 2016, and this year relative to 2014, the, that cumulative underspend relative to that is somewhere in the region, it depends on how you add it up and whose ad numbers you're looking at, somewhere in the region between 700 and 900 billion. So enormous reductions in investment spending. Now, some of that has come through already because somewhere between a third or and a half, again, it depends on whose numbers you believe, w were based in, the, in, in North America. And so much of that is in, that's why those rigs came off. So that's already come through. Also, some of it, that's nominal spending. Um, We've seen massive price deflation uh, over the last few years. So a dollar of investment spending today buys you an awful lot more than it did two or three years ago. So real investment spending has not fallen by as much. But even so, there has been a significant reduction. And the, the nature of those things is, so BP sanctioned less projects last year than it would normally do. But a project we sanctioned last year or not wouldn't come on stream until 19, 20, or 21. So you don't see the impact of these things, and, and they build up over time. And so the, the, the IEA's concern is that as those impacts of those CapEx spending come through in 19, 20, 20 21, supply growth um, declines, and that, that leads to this tightening in the market. The counterpart was your two, but I've got two things sitting on the other side. One is um, tight oil, and we sort of learned a lot from this resilience already and this year how quickly you can pick up. I also know there's a fair degree of excess capacity within OPEC. I sort of know that because I saw how much they've taken 1.8 million barrels a day off the market. I end up, I th I'm, I'm impressed by the resilience of US tight oil. I'm struck by the amount of spare capacity uh, within OPEC. So I end up being a little less concerned than the IEA about sort of this scope for a very significant price spike um, over the next um, two or three um, years. Um, on NGLs, um, yes, we have thought about it a lot. Um, if I start to try and answer that, I will uh, get way out of my league. There are two people on the co corner over here who are fantastic at that. So if you see them afterwards, they will give you, they would start starting to mouth me the answer because they know I wouldn't know the answer very well. I failed. So see them at the end and they will tell you the answer to it. Okay, we have two or three minutes left. Uh, I, I see one question well on this done, side. Well done, this side of the room. Well right. done, yeah, you've responded we'll take, to the we'll take a question from you, and then we'll take a question from the person right there, who I think saw my pointing to him. Lawrence Cope, Cope Associates. Uh, we get oil from a number of different production areas, like oil sands, deep water, uh, potentially more from Arctic areas. Of those areas, which ones would you feel would be most problematic in the future? Okay. And then, yeah. Tom Berger, XPP and Independent uh, Energy Advisor. I have a follow-up question to this gentleman's question. At what price do you think LNG sourced in the US or in Western Hemisphere could lend currently in Europe to compete with the about $5, $4.90 uh, per million uh, BTU in Russia? Um, so, so, sorry, I got a mind, but I didn't write. Uh, um, different types of oil plays. So, um, So I'm trying to not make this sound like a completely facile answer. I mean, I think the oil plays which are going to be struggle most are the highest cost plays. Sorry, I mean, that's an obvious point. Um, even more so going forward than the future. So what's really odd about the oil market today, the oil market is just a really odd market. And it's been an odd market for the last 20 years. And it's an odd market because you have low cost supplies, OPEC, and you have high cost supplies in other parts of the world where the same, in essence, the same thing is produced at three, four, five times the cost, and both of them remain in the market, and they're not competed out. I don't know any market in the world, particularly a global market, um, where somebody can produce the same thing for three or four times the cost of somebody else, and they remain in the market. Normally, they would get competed out of the market. Now, in a world of scarcity where it made sense for people to, to ration their, their production levels, 
that sort of under, sort of that made sense, and that's why we, where where we were. As we move to abundance, which is what I was talking about earlier, um, I think the market is likely to become increasingly competitive, and so those higher cost supplies are likely to come under increasing pressure. I think. The, the other point is, well, does that mean Canadian oil sands or deep water? What does that mean for all of those different things? I'm slightly nervous about sort of binary black and white type um, um, statements on those things, because every piece of analysis I've seen tends to give me a pretty wide band. So for m any single play, some things, the average price may be quite high, but there are some plays where, where they can be relatively com competitive. And so I think um, it's as you move towards higher cost plays, they're going to become an increasing pressure. But does that mean there'll be no investment in any of those plays? I don't think that necessarily cases because for any one of those things, um, you will see um, they will be successful. I mean, um, BP this year, um, is it this, this year, um, uh, sanctioned Mad Dog 2, which is in, in the Gulf of Mexico. So this is a, a deep water play um, where we are very comfortable that that is a, a competitive play. So I think this sort of that's in, that's out isn't the right way of thinking about it. It's a little bit more nuanced than that. The, the, the final question was on um, what do you need to compete to play? Um, I was worried that I disagree with somebody from Tellurium because I think uh, I think Tellurium. Uh, every time I read anything about Tellurium, they understand the gas market far better than I. So if I disagree with anything Tellurium said, believe them because they're far smarter than I am on natural gas. When I ever I speak to um, LNG exporters, they will tell me that they will be able to land in the near term. So not for many of those people, not covering uh, either the off takers, not covering their cost of, uh, of, the, of the liquefaction, but just operating costs. They'll be able to land LNG uh, in Europe over the next few years as, uh, as little as $4 or $4.50 MMBTU. So many LNG exporters have told me that. Now that's... So, so, so that's just purely that's an op that, so that's purely covering operating costs. What will they be willing to land uh, if they just cover their operating costs? Land um, uh, US LNG in Europe for and it, some. You know, I would often have been told four dollars or four dollars fifty MMBTU. The question that is, is is that low enough? And the marginal, I think, at the end. The battle here for this sort of surplus LNG, will it find a home, is Europe. Europe's a natural sort of market of last resort. And the fuel it's competing with is coal. And so the question is, is landing $4 or $4.50 LNG, uh, LNG sufficiently low to crowd out coal in the European uh, power sector? That's the issue. And all the analysis I've read is, no, it's not. Uh, that uh, Coal will be able to compete with that. And so there is a danger that some of that US LNG in the near term gets shut in if it can't compete with coal. And so, so that's the sort of numbers I've seen. And, and this is where carbon pricing makes a huge difference. Why, why did we see what's happened in the UK? What happened there? The UK is part of the European trading system. But then in, in 2015, the UK said, I want, I'm going to stay in the European trading system where carbon prices are about five euros a tonne, so very low. Um, but I'm going to put a carbon price floor in of about 20 sterling pounds. It's a bit com it's, it's all sorts of technical things, but about, think about 20 sterling pounds. So if the price ever falls below that, I'm going to, that's going to be my carbon price floor. As a result of which, we've seen almost the entire crowding out of coal um, in the UK power sector. If, and this is, this is not deep, difficult economics, this is purely political will. If Europe wants to put in a carbon price floor, uh, of, of 20 euros, then suddenly um, $4 MMBTU would start to become far more competitive against coal, and you could see a significant reduction of carbon emissions in, 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 in Europe. And so ultimately this comes down to prices. And, you, and the message to take from the UK, not only is it interesting history, the key message from there is prices work. We saw prices work here in the UK, US as, coal, as gas prices fell, the impact that had in the coal mix between gas and coal. We've seen it in the UK in terms of the carbon price floor. So when we're thinking about if we don't like the fuel mix, if we want to affect to think about it, a key message over the last few years is prices work, which is why BP consistently says if we're going to think about carbon emissions, we think carbon pricing is the way to do it.
You know, one other point is that, you know, there are markets other than Europe. I mean, if the prices for LNG go down too far in Europe, uh, American exporters are saying, yeah, but there's an Asia market and there's a Latin American market. And they feel that they can compete even going through the Panama Canal from the Gulf. No, and I think uh, in, in equilibrium, in, in sustainable sense, they will. And some of that will find markets. It's just the point is... I think we are moving to a world over the next, literally just a temporary adjustment here, over the next three or four years, where there'll just be a surplus of supplies relative to emerging demand. And so the question is, is where does that, so it will be able to compete in, in, in Central and South America, it will be able to compete in Asia. It's at the margin, the final bit of the competition plays out in, in Europe. And, and it's at, well, at a point where it plays out in Europe, the, the nub will be, can it squeeze out, can it right. generate even more demand by squeezing out coal? And that's why it will come down to that sort of battle at the end for the marginal thing. Okay, well, we've gone five minutes beyond our hard stop, so I think oh, we'd better, hard, I yeah, think we'd yeah, better stop. That, yeah. But uh, the, the f phenomenal presentation, and uh, I know everybody appreciates it, so let's thank Spencer Dale. Thank you very much.